So today uh, we are going to talk about, well, I'm going to talk about, and I hope we can have a good discussion on this, on how to stay disease-free, well, almost disease-free. We are going to have problems. There will be sickness at some points in our life. But uh, here what I'm talking about is, you know, having chronic conditions or problems that we're seeing around us. So by and large, we can stay healthy, we can stay fit, almost disease-free, if we just take a look and uh, at our diet, at what we are eating, at our nutrition, and at our food. So here we go. First, I want to start, uh, thank, uh, thank Seema and the entire Orange County India Association team for making this happen, for getting me in touch with all you guys, those of you who've joined. And yes, that's the next, um, you know, I want to thank all of you guys who've been able to join, take out the time, and uh, we, I hope, as I said, we can have a discussion. And because it is only, you know, when we discuss that we can share knowledge. And knowledge is a source of strength. And knowledge is a change enabler. And today, we do need a dire change in our health system, in our health ecosystem. And, you know, that brings me back to us, all of, all of us, because you know, we can be, we are the enablers of change, especially women, because women are the ones who are, who generally, who have this responsibility for health and nutrition. It's given to the wives, it's given to the mothers, and we expect them to be providing us with everything that we need, right? But when it comes to health, which is, which is more than nutrition, I mean, nutrition, I mean, we, we think of it as more than nutrition, but in essence, the true truth is, is that health is, nutrition is health. So the way we think, you know, our, our approach to that is that, okay, I'm eating and I am uh, exercising also perhaps. So I am okay generally. And if something happens to my health, I'll probably see the doctor, right? So we entrust the responsibility of health to doctors so i want to ask you but is this approach working we have so many doctors we have so many hospitals we have so many gadgets devices sophisticated tools you know science and technology advanced science and technology today we can probe into the body we can look what's happening we can see minuscule minuscule functions enzymes in action you know but but at the same time when we have all this sophistication around us what is the big reality what is the big truth what is the big picture that diseases are also growing health conditions are on the rise in fact most people during their lifespan are expected to have diabetes or high blood pressure right heart conditions blood pressure or cholesterol high cholesterol so uh, now we are also seeing increase in thyroid conditions, hair fall, skin conditions, infertility. IVF clinics are rising in, in like geometrically rising in every city across the world. People are having problems conceiving, having children. Then we have kidney stones, gallbladder stones, organs are being removed like, like it's very very common and okay thing to do. Gallbladder is removed, the uterus is removed. So we have GI problems, digestive problems, constipation, and a whole spectrum of ADHD and autistic conditions. So an autoimmune conditions, some of which are like totally baffling, right? We don't even understand, never heard of kind of things. So not only are diseases rising, but at the same time, there is an early onset of these conditions. So what does that mean? It means we are seeing children who are contracting these conditions, juvenile diabetes, you know, childhood obesity, early puberty, girls as young as six years old are menstruating. And this is, this started happening, this was noticed way back in the 80s, 1980s. And you know, today doctors say that it's normal for a girl to be menstruating and nobody is questioning why, why this should happen. So my question as an ordinary person, so I've been, I've embarked on this journey, you know, and I hope many of you join me in this to get to the bottom of things, to really understand, because is this really the way we want to live? 
is this the is this the health tech is this what we want to hand over to our children you know increasing data statistical numbers lifelong conditions and so many of the children are being born born with conditions it is uh, it is not uncommon to see children born with cognitive lower cognitive functionalities with holes in their heart with heart conditions you know holes in the heart so do we do we want do we want to accept accept such conditions maybe it's not affected us but at this point or maybe maybe it has some family member some friend but if this is if the numbers are going to rise this is coming closer and closer to us so so i want to and i i want to i want to jump i want to i want to make sure or well you know that we all join hands and we we explore we get to the bottom of what's happening we find the reasons because that's not the way because our attention is clearly in the wrong place and i do believe that these are all these are reversible these conditions are reversible we are not we are not condemned to live with them for life and there are people who are doing that who are reversing such conditions and i am fortunate enough to actually come across such a person you know personally you, you believe things and when you when you see things for yourself right and see people reversing their conditions so there is there is this person who is helping who and who has helped hundreds and thousands and lakhs of people reverse their conditions and live disease free rid get rid of their chronic conditions and his name is dr khader wali and i do want to pay my respect to that to him and i hope you know he has to uh, videos online you are welcome to go and search and i i'm also posting a lot of information sharing with everybody through my blog through my youtube channel and uh, i would and through also whatsapp groups so you can join me i've started another group and if you're interested you can email me and i can i can put you in that group where you will get all this information and you will feel empowered and you will feel that yes you can do you can change you can do things you can help your family you can help yourself and you can help your friends so he has been directing our attention to foods that heal foods that cure and foods that prevent sickness because that's where our focus needs to be we need to prevent sickness we need we don't cancer patients are told to stop having wheat to stop having sugar uh, you know or grains of wheat sugar and meat also meat uh during after they've had the after they've gone through so much but our question should be why is it that this information is not given before why are we not told clearly the connection between these foods and conditions so we can avoid them we don't we have to preempt them so we can preempt them so uh, and that's what i'm here to share with you that there are foods that exist our herbs our magical herbs that we have got in our heritage as a gift we need to go back and start exploring the power of those herbs and the power of foods that restore balance in us because the answer does lie in food the truth is that food when food is wrong no medicine is going to work whether whatever whether it is mainstream allopathy or alternative practices they might give you respite for a little while you might get into remission you might not see the pain suffer endure the pain or whatever it is that's associated but it is not going to get, help you get rid of this condition because it is not addressing the source and which is food a lot of it whatever our body is a, a body is a enzyme machine and you know a lot of functions are taking place because of the enzymes because of the good micro microbes in our gut so if these if this functionality is disrupted and the only thing that disrupt can disrupt is what we are taking in it's just obvious it's just common sense right so whatever we are ingesting is causing disruption in the functioning so we need to go and look at that what is it that we are taking in this entire we have the spectrum right that we ingest and in this in spectrum wherein on one end lies food or healthful food and the other hand other end of it is poison or toxin so we need to see we need to be clear that whatever we are taking in on where does it fall in the spectrum if it falls in the toxic spectrum then clearly we need we, to, we need to stop that we need to eliminate it from our diet only if it is helpful should we be taking that should we be eating it so 
So we cannot trust, we cannot trust people, others, who are giving us things in the name of food and expect to be healthy. It's probably, it is going to take a little time and effort, but this is all well worth it. So the other thing we'll notice is that, you know, when we start making these choices, when we start understanding food in this way, what it is doing to my body, we will transform our health and our children will learn, will, children will understand what it is, you know, that whatever it is that they're learning in school and health is over the years last health has been mandatory, right? In schools here, but everywhere, I guess. So, but it's not helping because diseases are just rising. So clearly what we are teaching, there's a disconnect between what we are teaching, the knowledge we are giving and the use of that knowledge. So, so we need to start questioning. We need to start looking at what knowledge we have and what knowledge we are passing on. And when we start, when we start, we, when we become possessors of the right knowledge, not only will all these diseases be eliminated from the, hu you know, from the human sphere, but we will see a magical restoration of the health of the planet itself. And these connections will become clear to us. I don't want to talk about it here. I just want to stick to health and nutrition, but I will be, I will be referring to all these things in my blog, in my video. Dr. Khadavali talks about it. You can, you're more than welcome to go and, you know, check his videos, but uh, you're of course welcome to come and check, you know, uh, subscribe to mine and see, see, see what's, what's really going on. What are the connections? So like coming back to food. So what is right food? So food, Whatever we are taking, we are taking in oxygen, which is critical. That forms part of our nutritional, you know, panel of nutrition. But because it's not solid, we do not, we don't really, you know, it doesn't have form of matter. Uh, and why I'm referring to that is because a lot of a lot of things are being ingested through air, you know, toxic air, polluted air, plastics in the air, or what, things like that. And plastics are matter which has decomposed so much that they actually have become part of the air. Also, it's been found. You can find articles to that effect. Uh, online, you know, and uh, uh, so our the pollution, the toxins have polluted our air, and the plastics are a major, major culprit of that. And uh, plastics in food, food packaged in plastics. So we we need to start looking at all that. The toiletries packaged in plastics that we use, not just in plastics, but also containing being being you know the ingredients, the the chemicals being a part of the products that we are using. For on our body because skin is an organ and what the skin will allow is the skin seeps through the chemicals seep through our body through our skin into our body and cause disruption so so we need to find uh, we need to question what is right food so food is not a passing fad a passing fad does not give answer to what is right food you know right food has certain features certain characteristics and that is what i want to share with you food what is food Food is something that gives us energy, right? We eat food because we need energy. And that energy comes from the basic, basic, ba the, the basic, um, uh, the particle or, or the your energy unit is glucose. So, and glucose comes from the carbs, the carbs that we eat, right? So anybody tells you to eliminate carbohydrates is actually misguiding you. Our body needs carbs. Our body needs glucose. But the problem is, and this is where the attention is not led, is that the right carbs, we need the right kind of carbs. So what happens? Most of the carbs is associated with rice, with wheat, right? So this carb, these kind of carbohydrates that are sources of glucose, for sure, that our body, that our body needs, become a burden on the body because they break in the metabolism process in the metabolic process they break down so quickly and the amount also if we are guzzling down like huge quantities of it through the day not just in one meal one plate if we are having uh, you know carbohydrates in basic different products like bread maybe rice bread as a snack or a cookie or a cracker right or a donut this is taken as snack or cereal in breakfast and then something else for lunch and something else most basically was wheat sourced from wheat or sourced from rice mostly 
or sugar is added sugar is added so on that on top of it on top of the carbohydrates the grains we have added the sugar as well right so what happens as a result is it increases the glucose level in our body and that's where all the mishap happens begins to happen because they break down so quickly the glucose levels increase in our body and this is happening day in and day out the from the moment we are born from the moment you know we start taking in food uh, you know uh, after the mother's milk so we are taking in all foods right so this is happening so this has been accumulating and the body is always you know brushing and sweeping and cleaning up the glucose uh, and as a result our pancreas become burdened so what does that result in and i can explain this to you at some point and my uh, you know like the process what's happening um so the body becomes burdened our organs the pancreas become burdened and in this process of always cleaning up glucose and we end up with a high uh, hemoglobin a1c hba1c and which is what we understand as diabetes so so glucose so having the right kind of food carbohydrate and because we need it is critical to understanding where disease comes from and why we have problems so the next thing so this is the glucose imbalance so the other thing the other thing that i want to talk about uh, the characteristic or the feature of food is a food that gives us nutrients we eat because we want those my macro and micronutrients right vitamins uh, uh, then the uh, the minerals so we if we look for a food that provides our body with those because nutrients are the switches which actually start the enzymatic functions you know the release of enzymes or the functioning so uh, the intelligence as to how it happens is coded in our body but we just provided that switch right the trigger so that is why nutrients are important and the third thing so when we are looking for food we are looking for nutrients the third thing when we are looking for food is if that food is cleaning our body so we can't just keep eating our body needs to eliminate and we are not going to be like 100% sure of the purity of whatever we are eating so elimination and because of pollution like things we are eating uh, taking in in terms of toxins also they they have to be eliminated too right so there is metabolic waste so all these things have to be eliminated so the food the food does that as well so that is what part of food the fiber so are we need to have fiber so the body is continuously cleansed so the feet, so the features are like you know energy like glucose then we have nutrients and then we had something food which cleans so if these if these are met then we can say that yes this is food but if whatever we are eating is not doing any of these even if one of these is being helped we can say yes we can have it in the quantities right but if if it is not meeting this criteria these features then that is not food then we are fooling ourselves then we are actually ourselves going on the path path of disease right so the great thing great thing about uh, Dr. Khadavari, who's actually called the millet man, is that there is a grain, which I've just said in the name itself, is that there is a gra grain or a carbohydrate that exists, which meets all these three criteria beautifully. It's been around for centuries, but for some reason, it's been sidelined and forgotten. And now he's working, and a lot of other people too, to... to ignite that interest turn our attention to this food and there are reasons why which i have addressed in another talk i don't want to if you have any questions i can take but but these are these are millets these are uh, millets are grains that that release because of the structure of the carbohydrate they release the glucose that our body needs slowly and steadily so in the process of digestion is slow and steady so it doesn't burden our system so there is never a glucose imbalance so people who have taken millets have freed themselves of diabetes even starting with hb a1 levels a1c levels as high as 13 14 12 they have reduced it to 5 or 6 normalized it in a span of 3 to 6 months and that is true so they have been declared diabetes free and uh, that 
that is a miracle. We have been told so far that we cannot, you know, we cannot, this is a condition, diabetes is a condition that we have to live with throughout our life. Not true. Same thing with blood pressure. The interesting thing about blood pressure is eating millets, cards, you can rid, get rid of your blood pressure as well. And there are certain herbs also, which I'll come to, you know, which help in this, which aid our body in this process of restoring, uh, of gaining uh, balance, homeostasis. So the interesting thing about, uh, about uh, high blood pressure is, and uh, is this, uh, is that when we have, when we eat glucose, you know, when we eat sugar carbohydrates, it's like when we have a glass of water in which we put sugar and we, it gets thick, right? The water gets a little thick. And if we keep adding more and more sugar, it becomes more syrupy and thick. So that's what's happening in our body, in the, in the blood, when we are eating, when our carbohydrate intake increases. We are, incre we are, so to speak, thickening the blood. When we do that, imagine the flow of a thick, viscous liquid is slow, right? So the heart, it becomes a burden for the heart, so the blood pressure increases. The moment you decrease your glucose intake, carbohydrate intake, your blood pressure also goes back to normal levels. So we've heard of salt as, as uh, reducing our salt. We associate salt with high blood pressure, right? But think of it, when you reduce your sugar levels, you normalize your high blood pressure. Now I'm going further, the same thing. Now when this blood, if the blood is not able to move, if that's impeded for some reason, your cells don't get the oxygen that the blood carries, not all the cells. So what happens? Your cells in the body start dying. If the cells are from the heart, you get angina. If it's more serious, you get a heart attack. If that blockage is in the brain, you get a stroke or a paralytic attack. So the, 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 thing, the thing is that this glucose imbalance leads to a variety of different conditions in our body. Now, when the glucose is high, the liver gets into action. It converts the glucose because we cannot have high glucose, uh, high sugar levels in the body, uh, more than about six to seven grams at one time. So the, the, it's all taken out and it is converted into fat or other metabolic waste, you know, and that's why we have knee pain, joint pain, because there are these ways the body is struggling to get rid of all that extra glucose and it turns it into fat, it turns it into different things, waste products. And, you know, that's why we have pain and problems, problems in the joints. And the moment we address this, we, you know, uh, uh, reduce our carbohydrate intake, all these problems magically disappear. So carbohydrate glucose levels to maintain that balance is critical, critical for preventing disease. The next thing that's problem, so the wheat, all the carbohydrate group that we are commonly increasing, uh, eating, wheat and rice are problematic. We need to start looking at consumption of millets. And the other problematic food, the other two major problematic foods. So a lot of these foods, you know, they were, they have been consumed for a long time, you would say and argue. So why is it that they're becoming problematic now? And that is milk and meat, right? Milk has been consumed for a long time. It has references in Ayurveda also. But, and meat, you would say people have been eating meat for a while, right? But meat and milk are highly problematic foods today. And alternative practitioners that are guiding some of the people who have chronic conditions are advising them to stay away, stay off meat, stay off dairy. And miraculously, these people are reversing their conditions and becoming normal, they are, are getting rid of these diseases. So why, what is happening? Shouldn't we be asking that what is it going on with the dairy, with meat? Meat, we can argue endlessly that we are not, human body is not designed for digesting meat. We were not meant to eat. We are not meant to eat meat. And meat industry is so huge today that one kg of meat takes about 50,000 liters of water, I believe. A very high number if this is not the exact number and what does that mean what does it mean it's draining our earth's resources by the way rice and wheat are water guzzlers as well which the whole world is eating rice wheat sugar meat right so they're all water guzzlers so water is going to become scarce and we already know it is scarce already rivers are drying up lakes are drying up 
where is all the water going to come from if you want to if we continue eating all this rice and wheat there is no water left what are our children and their children the next future generations going to eat so meat same thing you know it's it's a drain on our resources earth resources not only is it a drain it is even polluting it is even polluting our air it is increasing the carbon dioxide levels in the in the air which has led to climate change so you see the, you begin to see the connections here the food we eat the food we prefer is a huge drain it is it is burdening not only our bodies it is burdening the planet itself because the way we are so in terms of growing and in terms of how we are packaging how we are packaging these foods all in plastics so these are the things we need to start thinking of uh, if we want to restore health in ourselves and the planet so milk and meat because the way of the way they are produced animals are injected with growth hormones injected with antibiotics and they don't stay in the animals you think they're just going to stay there they it gets passed on when we have the products they're the meat products and the dairy product it is passing on to us it is passing on the on to the children and that is why there is early puberty seen in girls you know they start menstruating earlier 6 years it's shocking and how can we sit silent how can we just accept this as for a fact how can we accept all this data disease data as a fact because these are not these are not these are not something that are happening by the way they are happening because of the choices we are making choices we are making for growing for producing them and the choices we are making by choosing to consume them and milk is hard for calcium right we go to milk because we want calcium 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 is important for the body but guess what there are so many other sources richer far richer sources of calcium for example like a 100 gram of milk gives you 125 mg of calcium but 100 grams of sesame seeds gives you 1000 mg of calcium so you can have sesame laddu you can have sesame milk why don't we give this to our children try try that and see see what it does you know uh, in terms of do they experience calcium deficiency why do we need to have tablets you need to have sesame in limited quantities for sure you know not exceeding up to 100 grams a week but up to 100 grams is fine and you get all the calcium that your body needs and there are other sources like millet finger millet milk is another source of calcium and even that sharifa the apple custard apple the fruit so there are multiple sources of calcium that we, we that we are looking for and the milk and meat that we are uh, the milk that we are turning for is actually causing two imbalances first was the glucose imbalances wrong choice of carbohydrate and meat and milk are causing microbial imbalance and hormonal imbalance so early puberty is a is a sign expression of hormonal imbalance you know the increased uh, estrogen or what the levels in the body because they are, they are pumping oxytocin in the cows to increase the milk production a cow is supposed to give when the cow has calf it gives 1.5 liters of milk but we have not only here genetically modified the cows the cow, cows were originally brought from india over here and then they were they were genetically modified because they wanted to increase the production of milk so from 1.5 liters we are forcing a cow to give like much more liter because got, human needs have to be met when humans don't even need that right so how can we accept and this is by the way if you look at timing wise the same time early puberty and problems and uh, you know even uh, other associated uh, problems started uh, started happening in girls and in and this in men also it happens it's, it's seen is the expression find is it, i mean it's it's its effect is found in men also uh because when we drink if when pregnant women who are expecting so women drink this milk it passes on to the to the feet to the to the to, to the fetus right so children boys who are born with it with increased or imbalanced hormones see an abnormal growth in breasts and the other area where we find expression of this in men is lowered sperm counts and remember the increase in fertility problems and ivf clinics so this can all be traced to this to milk primarily to milk and we are giving this ourselves to our children so the, the the thing is that we are human beings are supposed to have major mostly plant based foods 
resorting to depending on plants for our food for our nutrition is the answer to eliminating most diseases today you know and there is nothing religious about it to not killing animals just if you look at it though although you cannot you cannot separate spirituality from this aspect too because uh, even in our, in yoga you know in the first yama in the first yam in the yama niyam the first yam itself is ahimsa how can we expect to have good health when it is founded our food is founded on violence something to think about so but if you even if you don't want to get into that plain and simple truth is that plant based plant based food is the answer to remove eliminating diseases especially the chronic diseases that we are seeing today we are not we are not supposed to live with them and manage them manage them for the rest of our lives so the uh, so when these three balances you know the glucose imbalance microbial and uh, your um, hormonal imbalance when these are upset they are like the software and hardware in our body right when the software and hardware the hardware is right the machine functions well you know then if you if you have any problems or whatever is it, it is you're trying to do with your with your machine it will deliver the results but if the software and hardware is malfunctioning how can you expect good results you know and then how can you even expect that you will have these vitamin supplements or you know this calcium uh, or vitamin d supplement and magically everything will get right your body is not receptive not ready to receive it because of all the imbalances so those have to be restored by eating the right foods by eating millets by eating fermented millets by eating herbal decoctions and teas and finding out what is it that our heritage has provided us, provided us in terms of these beautiful plants powerful plants that restore our you know restore functions enzymatic fu enzymatic functions in the body so there are also resources of phytochemicals and all the things we don't even need to get into that all the terminology they are just sources of things that are beneficial for our body plain and simple period and uh, so now let me come back to herbs i don't want to keep going on if you have any questions i'll take them uh, so the herbs that help since i've mentioned diabetes diabetes is a common condition so the diabetes what is it that helps us in diabetes so diabetes we have to have all the five pellets the five pellets that uh, the, these are therapeutic not the ragi the, those those are good but those are neutral pellets the five medicinal pellets are foxtail millet kodo millet and barnyard millet brown top millet and little millet so we have to eat all of these in, in uh, diabetic conditions and we have to have herbal decoctions made from giloe uh, there are botanical names but i'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that of mint leaves you know so these are the these are the plants that help in uh, uh, diabetic conditions giloe mint moringa or the drumstick and the black plum and tindora the tindora vegetable that we the leaves of tindora for high blood pressure for high blood pressure there are different set of herbs you know the bail the bail tree that grows in india it's found in india the leaves of that the leaves of holy basil tulsi the leaves of coriander uh, and there are two other uh, there is a there is a cactus grandiflorus and there is a indian variety of milkweed that then parijat is a wonderful herb for for actually um, helping us in lot of cancers parijat even things like even the banana stem leaf guava leaf so these are plants we should be growing plants around us we should be growing plants in community gardens and we should be sharing all this knowledge which actually traditionally it was passed on from one generation to another but it's getting all lost because because they are not considered scientific however uh you know making milk like this you know in the way i just described it's okay when it is having such effects such just disastrous effects on on our systems it is okay to use about 80000 chemicals maybe there are more in across all sectors of, of human endeavor like agriculture food industry to and to use all these chemicals without knowing their effects on the human body that is considered scientific that is accepted so why have why have these standards you know why and something that has been proven people are actually healing and curing themselves of conditions and yet we refuse to accept them and take them in our lives so 
so we need to we need to start uh, thinking about the about about all this and and uh, the other herbs to go back and stress i want to address this stress because these days everybody is stressed out from an adult to a child so how can we handle stress stress you know stress can be handled by in different in you know through meditative exercises which also definitely have a place and that's why the role of spirituality in 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 health is is important it, and it cannot be ignored and but the other things that can help in uh, mood swings uh, anxiety are uh, you know having codo millet specifically and foxtail millet and uh, but we have to have all five millets but you can increase so you have like three days of codo millet three days of foxtail millet and one day each of the other five millets and the herbs that help in this in stress related conditions are curry leaves banana stem leaves turmeric cinnamon then the common rue and they have to be had separately not mixed they have to be had separately uh, and then then meditation daily for 15 minutes at least just sit down in peace and quiet you know watch your breath there are a lot of there's a lot of uh, information about that i don't want to go through that and the third thing which we ignore which nature has given to us in bountiful way and in for free are the rays of the sun the sun without which there can be no life you know and what's special about the sun is that especially that magical hour the early morning and the sunset time and that's why we have Surya Namaskar, you know, yeah, elders advise, yoga advises, go do Surya Namaskar, especially at this time. Why? Because we pay our gratitude to the sun. And when we do that at that time, that seven to you know, 15 minutes around sunset and sunrise, when the sun is golden orange, that changes our biochemical process. That has an effect on the biochemical processes that are, that are actually taking, pre, pre, taking place in our body. So that ray, the, those rays at that time pass in through our skin and get converted into vitamin D, which we need. And three months of doing this, your vitamin D will be normalized. So I try to I try to do this uh, in the morning. It's usually very cloudy over here, so there's no sun that you get to see. But in the evening, I try to go out at that time, sunset time, and get this free vitamin D. So the herbs for immunity today. We need herbs for immunity. So we need to make our children the answer the attention we need to say you know where is the attention masking is social distancing has its place but where is the world putting its attention you know to, attention should be in making our immunity stronger today we have COVID-19 tomorrow we can have something else and we've had MERS and SARS in the past right so are we going to deal with these viruses that come up like in this manner and by the way, they are also coming up because of the way because of the way we are treating animals. Because all these viruses have come from animals. Um, another video, another presentation. <laughs> so, so, so we we need to make our immunity, our body function strong, so we can deal with the, with these viruses in a normal, in a way that our body is designed. Our desi we have a powerful system, powerful machinery inside us. We just have to enable it to work well by choosing the right foods. So, so the, the herbs that help in immunity, building immunity, are Bermuda grass, Tulsi, Giloi, Bale, uh, Pongamia pinata, which is Karanj, then Neem and People, Saptpatra, seven leaves. And there are nine leaves for the United States because they, some of these are not available here. But even if we have, you know, four out of them or three out of seven or five out of seven, we can use them. We can give it to our children early morning in the morning. Just give it to them, and uh, for 21 days, you know, give each leaf for like two or three days, and then move to the next. So we increase our. And I have a video on this: how this helps, why these herbs, and how it helps our immune system uh, build immunity, good immunity. For this particular virus, there are specific herbs, and they are the Japanese mugwort. Uh, it's called Artemis vulgaris, and there is Parijat and Giloe. Koto millet and little millet help in building our immunities, keeping our immunity strong. So it's advised to have these two millets specifically. Um, I try to eat millets every day too. Um, and I would encourage all of you to do the same. Uh, so, so there are different herbs, you know, I don't want to go on to so different herbs for different conditions. And I, I'd love to share with all of you migraines, you know, because this is very common, right? What is migraine? Migraine is basically small. We all have a lot of women say, oh, they have a headache or whatever, some migraine. Many, many, many women get experience this. 
So what is what is migraine? Basically, migraines are uh, when the small micro blood vessels they get blocked because they're not cleaned. And the answer to that is eating sesame seeds. You know, if you if you eat roast sesame seeds on an iron skillet, and if you eat three teaspoon of that for 21 days, or you know, uh, sesame oil if you have so three teaspoon of sesame oil, you'll be you'll be you'll notice that your migraine attacks will reduce, maybe even be healed of uh, migraine. Uh, there is a Pakistani person uh, that who had 18 stones in his gallbladder, 18 stones in the gallbladder. The doctor advised removal of the gallbladder. He went on a liver protocol, liver cleanse protocol. The leaves for that are common rue, fenugreek or methi, and pathar chatta, bryophyllum acacia. Then another punar nav. Punar nav is a magical herb. It's actually Pudar nav, just the name itself, renewed, right? It renews our entire cells of the kidney in, in a certain, in um, there is a time period. So uh, I believe um, in three weeks or something. So our whole kidney is renewed by, is changed by having tea of Pudar nav. In fact, this is what happens in the body all the time. All the cells in our body are renewed in a span of seven years. Some organs and some parts take longer than the others. But in seven years, everything is renewed. So we are not, never the same person, actually. We are always changing. So that was for, uh, for um, gallstones. Then there are herbs for knee pain, for differently able kids. For differently able kids, brown top and foxtail millets are advised. And having oils, oils, coconut oil, niger seed oil, safflower oil, sesame oil. And these need to be cold pressed. Ghani, ghani driven, bull, bull driven. So uh, how many, I probably you'll laugh that, you know, how many of oils are here? How, how can we have bull driven oils, right? But the thing is, we need to ask for these oils. Only when we ask is the market going to respond. We, so we need to start asking for the purity in things, for changing the ways things are made. So when we ask, and that, that's, where, that's where we become change enablers, change makers. We, that's, that's where we need to go, change, being change makers. Ask for the right thing. And that there is herbs for weight loss, for accident, wound healings. They're different. And I will be sharing all of these through my blog and my uh, videos, YouTube videos and uh, WhatsApp group. So I will stop here. And I just want to say that, yes, we can change things. We don't have to go the way we are going. We need to be proud of our heritage. We have, we have beautiful, bountiful knowledge shared by people like Dr. Khadarwali. And there are others, uh, definitely whoever who is giving you this knowledge, go and, you know, seek it, find it, trust it, use it. And uh, if you want to email me, join any of my uh, uh, groups, please uh, feel free to do that. Uh, my email is, I go with the name Savera Girl, S-A-V-E-R-A-G-I-R-L. And you can find me on YouTube if you Google. There's no ga word, gap between them. It's all one word, Savera Girl. And you'll find my videos. And I have a blog, saveragirl.wordpress.com. And you can email me at saveragirl2020 at gmail.com. So I will stop here now. If, you have, if there's questions, I'd love to take. And I will then end now. Bye, everyone.